Our next speaker is Niels van der Weide, and he will talk about semantics of two-dimensional type theory. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for organizing this wonderful conference. So what I'll be talking about is joint work with uh, Benedict and Paige, who are both sitting in the audience somewhere. And uh, it is indeed about semantics of two-dimensional type theory, so let me start with some uh, context of this whole stuff. So what people have been talking a about a lot these years is the home topy type theory, which is a quite recent development inspired by the Martin Luff identity type, and in particular by the fact that it gives types the structures of higher groupoids. Or if you want to get a more geometric uh, intuition to it, it gives a type, it gives types the structures of spaces. And the important thing of that is that it allows us to formalize uh, notions from algebraic topology in home topic type theory. But you can also do other stuff. So in home topic type theory, the identity type is always symmetrical. So if you have A equals B, then you also have B equals A. You can also not have this. And then you have a notion of directed type theory, so where the identity type is not required to be symmetrical. And this is called directed type theory. If we follow the, all of these analogies of homotopy type theory, then what you would expect is that directed type theory would give the types the structure of some kind of directed topological spaces. And these entities have already been studied by some person whose name I can't pronounce in a way that would not be offensive to the language. And that has been used to uh, study uh, concurrency and to model uh, concurrent programs and uh, prove stuff about it. So this is all very, very, very higher dimensional, but we're not that high. We're only uh, two dimensional. That's not really geometrically correct, but our talk is two-dimensional. So what is this whole two-dimensional stuff? Well, to, for that, we need to go back in the past a bit. So a long time ago, uh, there was a Hoffman and Streicher who wrote a paper about the groupoid model. And that is a quite important paper because it was uh, the first uh, model in which the UIP did not hold. But another important thing about this model is that it's two-dimensional. Thinking about groupoids, well, what is a groupoid? You have objects, which are points, zero-dimensional, but you also have morphisms between them, one-dimensional. So this is some kind of, you're studying one-dimensional objects, and that gives rise to a two-dimensional model. Stuff like this has been generalized by Richard Garner to a more general setting. But more people have been working on stuff like this. And I will highlight the people in the audience, which are uh, Andreas Nice and Paige North. And they've been working on a directed version on uh, uh, stuff in the previous slide, like a directed version of the groupoid model. And this is these are basically the first models of uh, directed type theory, or the first syntactic frameworks for uh, directed type theory. And if you look at this kind of stuff, then you see that it's interpreted not in something like groupoids, but like categories in which the whole uh, notion of direction becomes more crucial because you can't necessarily invert the morphisms. You don't necessarily have like A arrow B means B arrow A. So you have this whole notion of direction built into your stuff. So what is the basic problem we find with this, kind, uh, this work is that we think that there is, it is too ad hoc. If you look at them, they are, a, a unifying framework is missing. They uh, try trying to look at models, but they don't try to define a general notion of model. They don't try to define a general framework in which one can consider different kinds of models and different kinds of properties you might want from these models. 
And what we want to do is we want to develop such a framework which also unites both directed and undirected versions of two-dimensional type theory. And this has been formalized in Unimod. So now let's get a bit more concrete on um, what we did. So the first basic observation what we uh, made here is that instead of using categorical models, we need to get super high by using bicategories instead of categories. Because categories are one-dimensional thingies. Bicategories are two-dimensional. And by using two-dimensional gadgets, we'll have this whole two-dimensional, we'll get to the right stuff for uh, two-dimensional uh, type theories. And the other thing we then need to realize as well, we want to have a general framework. What kind of general frameworks do we already know? Well, there are a lot of people who define uh, frameworks for giving semantics of type theories. Like, you can pick whatever you want. Categories with families, display map categories, natural models, comprehension categories. And our choice was comprehension categories. And more specifically, whatever, more blah, 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 we wanted to adjust this notion in for the bicategorical case so we could use this to study uh, two-dimensional versions of uh, type theory. And the important notion we need for this is the notion of vibration, because if you hear someone talk about comprehension categories, it's just a matter of time before they will just shouting on about vibrations and so on. So this is also a crucial part in this talk. And nothing would be useful if we give no examples, so of high essence that we also give examples. So this is basically what uh, I will briefly sketch in the remainder of this talk. So first, comprehension categories, which is needed because we are taking this notion and adding by everywhere to get it better. So this is the notion of a comprehension category. We have this kind of triangle where this guy basically takes a comprehension. C is the context. E are the types over our context. And we have this function f, this functor f, which is, should be a vibration. The structure of a vibration is what allows us to do substitution. So we need this f to do substitution, and this chi for context comprehension. And the important property, property here is that this f is required to be a Grosin deep vibration. So to make this bicategorical, what we're going to do is we copy-paste the slides, we add by everywhere where it needs to be, and, <laughs> and we need to find a suitable notion of gross and deep vibration for bicategories. And that last point is the difficult part, although it has been studied. So that is something I would like to uh, expand a bit upon. So if you see the title of this slides, and if you ever did bicategories, then you know that this seems to be very uh, scary, but I will be quite, uh, I won't go into much details. But the general idea is that if you do something with bicategories, you always have something globally on the objects and locally on the one cells. And for the notion of vibration, we both have a global condition where we talk about objects and a local condition, which is more in the homes. And to be a bit brief on this, is the global condition is like substitution, which is something we all know, and the local condition is some kind of coercion, where if we have a relation between two substitutions, then we can coerce from one substituted type to the other. And then we can do what I described before, take the slide, copy, paste. Oh, wait, it's different. Bye, bye. And here we have the conditions I mentioned before require for F instead of being a growth and vibration. Now, let me briefly mention two examples. So to get the details of the examples, you need to be a bit more uh, knowledge on bicategory here. So I'll be brief. The first one basically generalizes stuff like groupoids. And that is basically just take the arrow <coughs> codomain and you have something, yay. But this is undirected. We also want directed. And for that, we got the same problem as what we have before, so that you need to talk about more and more and more vibrations. So instead of taking the arrow, 
we need to take off vibrations to get a suitable vibration. And this seems to be a fair specific to categories, but we can generalize this to arbitrary biocategories to a general setting for directed types here by using, how surprising, again, vibrations. So, yeah. Uh, conclusion, what did I want to say here? What did I all shout about this hour or 10 minutes or whatever? So we had like a notion of comprehension by a category. What we also did is we, uh, we defined a syntax and we also showed that the syntax is sound with regards to the, this notion of a model. We also gave some uh, examples of the framework and yeah, if you want to know more, here's a paper. Are there any questions? Thanks. What I was wondering is, in the work of Dan Licata and Bob Harper, there is this um, coupling between arrows of, of, like arrows on the type level and arrows on the term level. Like you can only have an heterogeneous morphism from A to B if, if there's a morphism in the same way between the types. And I was wondering if this also holds in, in like this framework or not. Um, let me try to put the remark first. So. <laughs> because if you. Because here it seems you have a more clean separation between like two cells and, and one cells and, and like I was looking for a point where they get conflated somehow and I couldn't find any so I, had, I was hopeful that these would be decoupled. Yeah, I think the, the, if you compare this to Likata and Harper, I think there are quite some differences. So Likata and Harper also basically see terms as the same as certain morphisms, if I recall correctly. So I think here there's a bit less conflation happening and uh, more uh, structures with regards to semantical notions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, since this uh, kind of uh, ring the bell for me, if uh, your work um, was related to the work of Diliberti and uh, co-authors uh, who gave um, an interpretation of type theory uh, which is uh, re relies on a two-categorical framework and is kind of uh, uh, really general. So uh, I was wondering if one was the special case of the other or in, in a sense, for the other, it was possible to to, br uh, to have a bridge. Which work? I I not be uh, un fully heard what, which work you said. Well, uh, which one? Who wrote it? Uh, Ivan Di Liberti. Oh, I, I, yeah. So I think so. Uh, I talked to Ivan last month, and basically what I, we were talking about some stuff related to a paper he did about some frameworks, and basically yes. what he generalized was. Uh, one-dimensional framework, and then he saw us, which is one level higher, and it was like, oh, it doesn't fit in our framework, it's too high. So I think there is a bit of a separation with regards to what kind of stuff we study, because he looks at more categorical stuff, while we look uh, one dimension higher. Okay, thank so you. So I think there, that is, uh, it's not like a generalization, but more like dimensional you know, conflicts. Do you have an idea how to extend your framework to uh, basically type constructors? Like if you wanted to have a full type theory, you would need something to have pi types, yes. sigma types and stuff? Yeah, so, okay, so this is something we're currently thinking about. So, uh, so for, you can basically kind of use the same methods as for comprehension. The main difficulty will be rec with regards to stuff like the identity type and the pi type, because there you will have some notion of variances needed. So then, if you have stuff like this, then you basically need to mix either multiple comprehension by categories or you need to have something to be able to talk about the variance in on the base category to have this built in. So this guy, uh, so for building in type formers, I, we, I think we can use the same method as for comprehension by categories, but there will be difficulties with regards to the identity type, which is also uh, present in the work by North uh, uh, to the, towards the directed type, blah, 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 and the, and the, uh, the pi type. The, those are, will be the main challenges because then the whole notion of variance need to build into the system. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so you mentioned that you, you chose to use uh, comprehension categories uh, as opposed to you know, other, other notions of a model of type theory. So I was wondering if you could say why, or kind of give more of a reason of, of why you picked uh, that. Okay so, okay, so first of all, you have a lot of uh, kind of models which are built in to be strict, like uh, CWFs, uh, categories with attributes, they are built in to be strict. 
And this will already be more complicated for bicategories where these kind of strictness can, can't be expected. And also, you need to have weakness because in practice, you're weak. So you want to be able to talk about the weak stuff without being forced to be uh, strict. So that already eliminates the stuff that is strict by default. So then what remains are notions like a display map by category and a comprehension by category. And the reason why I think comprehension by category is more suitable as a start, although a display map by category is, is something that's, that's also good to develop, is because the, the way to formulate this definition is more straightforward, in my opinion. Because the only stuff that it is really dependent on is the notion of vibration. Well, for display map by category, you're, if you would look at examples like the street vibration, the general ones, that is already going to mess up because you're looking at like full sub by categories of arrows, which is not the case for the street vibration and also not the vibrations. So the notion of display map by category is less obvious than comprehension by category. So that is the reasoning for comprehension and all the vibrations and stuff. It's more straightforward to do, in our opinion. Well, stay forward is a bit of a <laughs> sounds nice, sounds easy, which is not. So, yes. Uh, if I may, just uh, this is kind of in that direction. So you said you have the soundness result to interpret over these uh, comprehension categories, but typically, uh, what you have as a problem is you have to restrict yourself to strict vibrations because you get otherwise into coherence issues when interpreting a type theory. Why is this not an issue? Okay, so, okay, so this is again something that requires some uh, explanation. So okay, if you look at this kind of stuff, then you are saying that, oh, the syntax I have has strict rules. Yeah. So then you build in these strict rules in the syntax. And if you're then going to formulate a model for the strict rules, then what you need to do is you need to take your vibration, replace it by something better, which is strict. But what we decide our syntax to be weak and have weak uh, rules with regards to substitution because it fits the framework better. This does not eliminate the need for this kind of strictness, but in the bicategorical case, it will immediately get more complicated because you need to do two steps. Yeah. Instead of just replacing your vibration by something better, you need to replace your bicategory by something better because you also want your context and so on to be strict. So you need to have a coherence theorem followed by a strictness theorem to get the kind of strictness and the for rules for substitution that you're talking about. Okay. Does that mean that the theory has itself kind of coercions built in so that you can do the type checking? I see. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That was the local operation, the local condition oh, for vibration. That's like a, some kind of coercion. Yeah, no, I mean in the, th in the type theory itself, yes. in the syntax, you will also yes. have this coercion. Okay, I see. Yes, indeed. <laughs> thank you. Let's thank the speaker again.